So uh, again, today I'm going to talk about combining uh, stereotactic body radiation with uh, brachytherapy. So uh, what do we know about combined modality treatment? As Dr. Scuteris mentioned, uh, it has often been used in both intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer pa patients. Uh, this is a slide done by a group of us with Peter Grimm uh, in 2012, which was a current review of the literature of various treatment modalities. This slide was taken looking at criteria for intermediate risk patients. And you can see from this graph that there are surgical radical prostatectomy patients, brachytherapy patients, external beam alone patients, combination of external beam and seeds, uh, and various other uh, modalities. Uh, uh, a smaller number in terms of the studies. And you can see here that uh, the, the arm that seemed to have the longest follow-up uh, and the highest cure rates was the purple, purple circle, uh, which represented a combination of external beam radiation therapy and some type of a seed implant. In most of these studies, the external beam radiation therapy was given at standard fractionation uh, from usually 40 to 50 gray of standard fractionation. But you can see from this, this slide that, that we've had very promising results using combined treatment, uh, certainly in intermediate risk prostate cancer patients. This is a slide I made many years ago, uh, just kind of showing you uh, uh, the outcomes of this type of combined radiation seed implant and comparing it on the left with a few large uh, slides of uh, radical prostatectomy. Many of them were uh, multi-center uh, retrospective outcomes. Uh, but you can see here, if you look at the radical, radical prostatectomy data, that once you got into intermediate risk patients, you were really talking about 70% uh, biochemical control rate uh, in the series uh, on the bottom, on the left from the BJU. You could see intermediate risk patients out by 10 years are really somewhere around 60% uh, freedom from biochemical uh, failure and a similar thing from the CAPTURE database published in the Red Journal in 2007. And just a, a, a kind of a snapshot of some uh, uh, papers at that time. Uh, one is from Michael Dottoli showing that using combined radiation therapy uh, with an implant and external beam resulted in closer to a 90% biochemical control rate. The second slide was from John Sylvester from the Seattle group, uh, also showing similarly about a 90% biochemical control rate with combined external beam and CDM for intermediate risk patients. And finally, a paper that we published in the Journal of Urology, where we were looking at the effects of androgen uh, suppressive therapy uh, added to a combination of implant and radiation, we found that it, in our retrospective analysis, it did not confer an advantage, but it did show overall similarly a 92% biochemical control rate in this study at, at eight years. Uh, this is some details of that study. Uh, again, uh, we had uh, mostly inter uh, intermediate risk patients, and it was a combination uh, treatment of 45 gray and palladium-103 implant. Most of those patients had the palladium-103 implant prescribed to a dose of 100 gray, uh, which was done first, followed by 45 gray and 25 fractions. Uh, again, here's that slide again showing about a 92% biochemical control rate. So clearly, this has been a very good uh, option in the treatment of certainly intermediate as well as both intermediate and high-risk patients. Uh, this is just showing no difference between the hormones and the no-hormone therapy group. Uh, but probably the most important uh, study really looking at this was uh, you know, one of the true randomized trials done. Uh, basically testing androgen suppressive therapy combined with elective nodal radiation and dose escalated radiation, either in the form of IMRT or a brachytherapy boost. So all patients in the study got whole pelvic RT at standard fractionation, uh, and then they were randomized to get an IMRT boost or to get boosted with a brachytherapy implant. Uh, and this is what the, uh, the data showed. Uh, the biochemical control rate is significantly better uh, in, the, in the group that got brachytherapy combined with external beam compared with external beam alone. This study was, uh, these 
differences were uh, seen in both intermediate risk patients. Here you can see that uh, at nine years, biochemical re relapse free survival was 70% with external beam only versus 94% with a combination of external beam and a seat implant. This is the same slide, but looking at high risk patients showing at the bottom, you can see a nine year biochemical relapse free survival of 58% uh, with the uh, radiation therapy alone arm versus 78% for the combination of external beam radiation therapy. Again, standard fractionation with a brachytherapy boost. So what is the rationale then of combining SBRT and brachytherapy? Well, I don't have all the slides up because there are certainly many, but around this time, and certainly over the last 10 to 15 years, what has emerged is a, a body of usually single institution data and some uh, um, multi-institutional groups uh, looking at outcomes of stereotactic body radiation therapy. So what does that mean for, uh, especially for the non-radiation uh, uh, oncologists uh, in the audience? It's basically uh, the SBRT is a code uh, that we use, a Medicare code, a CPT code. It was originally used primarily to treat brain tumors and spine tumors. Uh, Medicare allowed anywhere from one to five treatments. Uh, and so early on, especially with the emergence of the cyber knife uh, developed by Jonathan Adler, uh, to treat neuro cases uh, uh, was the idea that you can potentially treat prostate cases on that. And because the SBRT code was given uh, at a maximum of five fraction, that's what typically was adapted uh, to treat prostate cancer. And data has emerged uh, that those outcomes have been comparable and maybe perhaps better than standard fractionation when dealing with just external beam radiation therapy alone, so much so that the NCCN guidelines now state that for low and intermediate risk patients, SBRT is a valid treatment option. So what can we extrapolate from that? Well, we know that then perhaps SBRT, five fractions, and usually the dose is somewhere between 700 and 800 centigrade per fraction. The fractions can be given every day or every other day, as with most of the RTOG trials, is that this can be an alternative and perhaps a very attractive way of treating patients who are getting external beam alone. Also, what do we know from the slides that I just showed you? That is brachytherapy combined with external beam radiation therapy at standard fractionation demonstrates excellent and safe outcomes for both intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer. Uh, it has been shown in now in a randomized trial to, uh, to produce superior uh, biochemical control rates, external beam and brachy versus just external beam alone that's combined in both groups with hormonal therapy. And as I said, SBRT now appears to be comparable in many cases, perhaps better than standard fractionation. And it's also been shown to do this without increasing toxicity. So there certainly is a rationale for taking the external beam uh, component of combined implant and radiation and replacing it with stereotactic body radiation therapy, which certainly would overall shorten the length of time and perhaps shorten uh, symptoms and certainly be, would be a favorable option for patients. So this was uh, the first uh, publication on it. This was a uh, phase two trial done by a friend of mine, Russell Fierz at Allegheny General Hospital. Uh, uh, Dr. Stone and I uh, were instrumental in helping him get started with brachytherapy many, many years ago. Uh, and he uh, basically started this phase two trial with hypofractionated image-guided radiation therapy, followed by a prostate seed implant boost for men with newly diagnosed intermediate and high-risk adenocarcinoma of the prostate. And this was a paper uh, published uh, in PRO, and it's basically the preliminary results of the phase two trial. So the trial consisted of uh, this IGIMRT, they didn't call it SBRT, they calculate a, a biologic dose of 2465 that uh, in five daily fractions of 493 centigrade per fraction, which they found would be equivalent to giving 45 gray in 25 fractions. This was then followed in two to four weeks by a permanent palladium 103 seed implant. 
Um, and here you can see uh, the, these were both intermediate and high risk patients. The median age was 67. The median age, uh, the median PSA was a eight. eight. Uh, initial AUA score was 6.5 with a SHIM score of 15. Typical patients, they had uh, 12 patients who had Gleason score seven, three plus four. 10 patients with Gleason score uh, four plus three. And two patients with Gleason score four plus four. The stage distribution was T1C and 12, T2A and 11, uh, T2B and one. Uh, using the NCCN risk group stratification, there were 20 intermediate risk patients and four high risk patients. And hormone therapy could be used at the discretion of the doctor. So five patients got hormone therapy and 19 did not. Uh, and this was the outcome. Uh, their main point was looking at the tolerability of this regimen. And this is figure one, which shows the AUA symptom scores obtained at follow-up examinations after the seat implant um, with the pretreatment AUA scores uh, signified by uh, time zero. So the pretreatment, uh, the average pretreatment scores, as I said, was 6.5, the IPSS prior to treatment at one month after the seed implant as what as when as what we would all expect with a palladium 103 implant it jumps up it's the acute phase of the of the of the symptoms to 21.5 uh really similar to all implants um uh, in combination treatment uh, by six months it's down to 12.5 continues to go down by two by two years it's back to baseline this is almost identical to the type of curve the Dr. Stone and I published many years ago, looking at all of our brachytherapy patients, both alone and with combination treatment, uh, looking at the kind of the the, uh, the rise in PSA in the early one to six months and the slow uh, uh, gradual uh, decline in symptoms uh, out to two years. There was, uh, after that, a slight increase in the uh, IPSS in the few patients that were followed out to 30 and 36 months. Um, looking at the grade two and grade three GI and GU toxicity, uh, you can see um, looking at acute less than 12 months uh, in terms of proctitis, uh, nothing really significant in terms of grade two. Um, hemorrhage, some diarrhea, uh, there were no fistulas, uh, no proctitis uh, at this point, and the GU um, urinary frequency, of course, was the most common thing, which we see in all patients. Again, no different than you, combining this with standard fractionation, um, uh, and so that's the most common thing. So I think that uh, the D90 dose was overall median was 106.9. The median follow-up was 18 months, again, relatively short follow-up. And uh, the median Nader PSA was 0.5 at that time range, at range from 0.006 to 5.8. But again, this did include some patients with hormone therapy. Uh, the time to PSA Nader was 16 months. The overall survival was 100%. And at the time of this publication, uh, there was one biochemical failure in a patient that had distant metastases. So if you look at this just with very preliminary and looking mostly at acute toxicities, uh, this certainly did differ very much uh, to using standard fractionation. Uh, this is the next trial done uh, looking at this exact same concept done uh, by Marissa Kohlmeyer, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, uh, entitled Low Dose Rate Brachytherapy, combined with hypofractionation radiation therapy for critically localized intermediate risk prostate cancer uh, results from a prospective trial. Uh, this trial uh, included 40 patients with intermediate risk prostate cancer. Uh, and the graph on the right shows you their typical uh, seed implant with the isodose lines, uh, as well as their uh, external beam planning system with some sparing of the urethra. And this was the results of the study uh, looking at the post-treatment IPSS. Uh, and what you could see here is they had at one month, perhaps, uh, their baseline was an IPSS of five. The FURA study had an IPSS starting on average at six. Uh, they went up to uh, almost identical uh, average IPSS. Theirs is about 14. Uh, the other study was about 12. And the, there was a slow uh, decrease, uh, a little bit of a bounce seen in urinary symptoms, which is not unexpected at about 12 months. And then again, a slow decline. So very, very similar 
post-treatment IPSS curves, similar to the, the prior phase two trial by Fur et al., and also very, very similar to uh, combination treatment with standard fractionation um, and, and brachytherapy. This is just looking at their mean post-treatment, i.e. FF scores. Uh, the gray line represents patients who had base or baseline potent. Uh, you can see at least during the first 36 months, um, there wasn't, uh, in comparing it to a cohort that, that was treated more standardly, there wasn't any significant uh, uh, changes seen in the IEFF. And overall, this was the, the mean post treatment PSA levels. Uh, you can see them go down starting at a little above eight uh, and going down a significant drop within the first month, probably due both to uh, the high dose rate nature of the external beam component with SBRT. Again, their dose was 500 centigrade uh, times five, 2,500 centigrade. Uh, and you can see their PSA just kind of uh, nadering down at around 12 months. Uh, and on average, there in the median values, there is uh, there's no uh, bounces or elevations in PSA uh, seen. So just to summarize, so far it looks like with low dose rate brachytherapy uh, and and co a combination of low dose rate and SBRT types regimens, we're seeing very similar both toxicity profiles and PS initial PSA response rates. Uh, to using standard fractionation with brachytherapy. Uh, this is uh, the most recent uh, paper by Michael Zaleski looking at using high dose rate brachytherapy combined with that same type of ultra hypofractionated radiation and high risk prostate cancer patients. So their HDR dose was one insertion at 15 gray and their SBRT regimen was five gray uh, times five and it could be to the prostate. And in their case, they also uh, on occasion did treat some pelvic lymph nodes in the external beam field uh, with that type of dose fractionation. Androgen deprivation therapy was used in about half of the patients and 90% of the patients were high risk and 33% uh, percent, uh, were intermediate. Uh, so according to uh, their outcomes, the median follow-up was 24 months. The, there was no grade greater than three toxicity observed. The acute late grade two toxicity was about 1%. Late grade two genital urinary toxicity was observed in six and 9% of patients respectively. This is just a graph of both the, the GI adverse events, grade one and grade two. So with grade two, it's almost uh, close to zero uh, over time. And with grade one, uh, it's really un around uh, up to 20%, which again is mild symptoms. The GEO adverse events, again, uh, grade two was probably about 5%. And uh, the grade one, I should say, in grade two really was bordering out uh, by 24 months. Uh, up to 40%, again, mostly a result of irritative urinary type symptoms. So on that note, I'd like to conclude to say this is a very promising area. I know that I personally, uh, since these trials have come out, have treated uh, over 100 patients with this combination of SBRT and an implant, and my initial clinical impression uh, has been they tolerate the treatment quite well. Uh, at this point, if you are offering these patients this type of treatment, I can tell you a couple of things. One is virtually everyone will take it over the uh, five weeks or 45 gray. Uh, in terms of uh, reimbursement, uh, what I can tell you is that currently most Medicare patients uh, can get reimbursement for both SBRT and an implant. For more private insurance or private uh, um, uh, Medicare practices. They may not pay for the SBRT component, but you can treat the patient with this, but you will only get paid for five IMRT treatments and a palladium uh, implant. So again, very promising studies. Uh, I think we're all interested in seeing follow-up of those studies and, and some other studies that are uh, currently ongoing, but certainly a very promising uh, way of treating combination therapy.